Fantastic. Alrighty, folks, uh, we're going to get started here in the interest of time. I know we have a lot to cover. Um, so real quick with the open public meeting statement. In accordance with the re requirements of the Open Pub Public Meeting Act, Chapter 231, PL 1975 announcement, I wish to announce that the New Jersey Open Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the school districts of the Chathams Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, place thereof posted in the Board Administrative Offices, sent to the clerks of the Chatham Borough, the Chatham Township, the Library of the Chathams, the Chatham Courier, the Daily Record, the Star Ledger, and the TAP. Uh, Mr. Tequila, do you mind taking attendance? Mr. Gilfillan? Mr. Arnick? Here. Ms. Ciccarelli? Here. Ms. Clark? Here. Mr. Del Sandro? Here. Ms. Kenny? Mr. Ryan? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. And Ms. Weber? Here. Eight present and accounted for. Thank you. If you're able, please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so real quick under board president's comments, uh, the, the board members will take notice in your folders. There's a, a single sheet of paper with a blue border on the top. Um, since Mr. D'Alessandro is new, Typically we do this annually, but since Chris is new, I just want to take the opportunity um, to kind of cover again the role of a board member. So a lot of people think that we do, you know, have more control than, than we really do our authority, I should say. But I just want to call your attention to some of the ethics. Um, you know, uphold the laws, make decisions in the best interests of children. I will confine my board actions to policy making, planning, appraisal, and I will help frame policies and plans after the school board has consulted with those affected by them. Now, I don't want to read all of them, but D, I want to highlight. D states, I will carry out my responsibilities not to administer the schools, but together with my fellow board members to see that the, they are run well. So just to, it is not the role of the board members to come in and say, you know what, I'm going to come in and I'm going to rewrite the math program because I think my little Johnny would do better if the math program were this. They don't come in and say, I'm going to revamp the world language department because I want to learn, you know, Whovilleism. They don't come in and say, you know what, the science sequence isn't working for me, so I'm going to make a personal goal to just revamp that because I heard it's better in, you know, Smithville. While everybody comes to the table with personal experiences, they also come to the table with a, a, a moral compass to just do the right thing. Everybody at this table, not one person at this table comes with an agenda. They don't come and push their own personal agenda, but they do come with their experiences. Some may have more experience in, in insurance and they may ask more pointed questions, but the role is to listen to the administrator's recommendation, ask questions, maybe challenge it a little bit. Hey, how did you come about that? Why are we doing that now? What are the pros? What's it gonna cost? You know, do we have to do it 100%? Can we do it 80% and be just as effective? So our job is to listen to the recommendations and then plan policy, be fiscally responsible, and ensure that we're delivering a great education. Our role is just to ensure that the educational environment is one that the students can grow and discover. But it is not our role to decide what is going to be taught or how it's gonna be taught. That's for the educators to do. There's also another um, probably misconception, I think, and, and it'd be nice. And Chris, you're kind of the newest guy on the board and Bradley to some extent. You know, you hear this buzzword, transparency, transparency. The board, this committee, that group is not being transparent. I don't know, and I look to the, the new fellows on the board, how to be any more transparent. All of our meetings are in public, taped, recorded, streamed, lived, and posted. All of the information that goes on in the committee, I'm looking to the finance committee, all of the discussions that go on at the committee level are then brought to the full board. So the full board sees it at the same time as the public. For example, the finance committee has been working on the budget for weeks and months. 
they're going to do a presentation today and it will be the first time the rest of the board sees this presentation at the same time as the public. So there's this misconception that it's not being, you know, folks aren't being transparent and it goes beyond, you know, sometimes, you know, in campaign letters to the editor, they'll say, oh, there's no transparency and we deserve more. You know, I, I looked to Chris and Bradley, if you see room for improvement, and Bradley, you have, you, you, in the last year, you've spoken up and said, you know, hey, maybe we can do it this way, why don't we do it that way, and, you know, you listen to the rationale. So I just wanted to clarify again the role of a board member, not just for ourselves, remind ourselves what our role is, but also the public, so they understand what the limitations to the role is. Um, again, there's not one person at this table has ever come in the door and said, you know what, I went to XYZ school and I'm the smartest guy or gal in the rule. I've never, I have no idea where anybody at this table went to school, um, except for Anne, because we went to the same school. <laughs> um, although she's much younger. But, um, so again, I, if, I didn't know if anybody had any questions. I just wanted to throw that out there, because I think a lot of people send me posts from Facebook. I'm like, well, that's not our job. Our job is to not revamp the educational system in Chatham. It's been very successful for 127 years. Our job is to ensure the students have what they need and the administration has what they need to, to deliver that education. So I just wanted to um, you know, throw that out there because Chris was here, I want to cover the ethics again. So, I mean, if anybody has any questions or, or would like to piggyback on that. Thank you, I want to piggyback. Um, and I think it's important. Can you, is mine working, Connor? Yes. Okay. Um, I think I would be neg negligent not to respond to recent online commentary by a group of residents regarding recent board action. I found these comments offensive and upsetting primarily because this board is committed to meeting in person unlike the majority of school boards in the state the public are welcome to come here they're encouraged to come here and we invite you to come and make your commentary here at the microphone if there you have an issue with the board decision one thing i want to make very clear is that i speak for the majority of this board as we appointed jill weber to be the president of this board when it was voted on it was unanimous the role of the president is to run an orderly meeting and allow for the board to conduct board business in an orderly fashion Jill has the microphone more than other board members because she is the president. She speaks on our behalf. She does not speak for us. All of our voices can be heard. We are a nine person board and for whatever reason, a target has been put on Ms. Weber's back. You might think that you know, Ms. Weber or any of us don't have feelings, we don't care, we roll it off, but after a while it starts to sting. Especially since this board, what this board has been able to do for this community and this town over the last year. Every individual on this board has sacrificed hundreds of hours so that we could get our children safely in school, but no one has done it more, more so than Jill. We do not expect every person to agree with every decision this board makes, but you must understand that much goes into every, every decision, much discussion and much thought. I ask that before you jump on a screen to make a comment or an ill-informed judgment Think about, would you say it in this room if you were standing at that microphone to this board? And keep in mind, would you say it because the community is listening? They're watching online to our meetings. If the answer is no, then think again. We are your neighbors. We live in this town. I'd like to think that we are all in this together. Okay, great. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate that. Um, I don't see anybody else picking up my mic, so I think we can move along. Everybody's good? Excellent. Well, Chris, keep us on our toes. Let us know where we, um, you know, one thing I think I forgot to mention last time, Chris is uniquely qualified. He, he owns a local business here in town, so he probably has access to more of our residents and our neighbors than we do. So people will probably approach you more than any of us. So let us know, um, you know, where we can improve. And Bradley, the same, but you, again, you've been here a little bit longer. But uh, I'm sure. Thank you, Chris. Speak up. Um, Okay, so that was a little bit longer than typical. So, Dr. Lasus, I know you have a, a lengthy report. So, without further ado, I'm going to kick it right over to you, and we'll have at it. I, the board members should go in the audience, correct? Yes, I think that would be the easiest way to do it. If you guys head down there and bring a pen or a you know paper so that you can jot any questions down you have, I'll try to go through my whole my whole thing, and then we can come back up and discuss and ask and answer questions okay. and so forth. So, just a heads up, board members, if you want to grab a paper and pencil. Uh, Mike's going to go through all three segments, and then we'll come back up to the stage.
All right, thank you for, for transitioning. Um, I have to say it's hard to believe a year ago on March 16th in 2020, we had a board meeting and it was our very first day of virtual instruction throughout the district. And at that board meeting, if uh, all of you recall, we didn't have one single member of the public, not even a member of the press. It was just the board members and a, a few of gathered hastily and we moved through the preliminary budget for this current school year and did so quickly and of course none of us could have really imagined what would ensue uh, in the coming months. So here we are a year later. The purpose of this presentation in part is to talk about the preliminary budget and give an overview. Uh, but as everyone knows, there's so much swirling around right now and, and things are changing quickly. So I'm going to also address plans this spring uh, for the remainder of the year, preliminary plans that we have as well as uh, what we're working on this summer to support our students. Uh, first, a note of thanks to Atlantic Health Systems. Uh, they've reached out to every school district in Morris County to try to expedite vaccines for or vaccination of staff members. Um, they've been very responsive and we had probably around 160 staff members receive their vaccines in the past 10 days uh, as a result of Atlantic Health. So we're moving in a, a very positive direction there, and um, we're, we're really grateful for their partnership. It will make the end of the school year, we think, a little bit more um, calm and, and better uh, on our part. So thanks to Atlantic Health. I'll just mention again, like I did at the last meeting, that from the beginning of this school year, way back to the summer, our goal was to have students be able to participate in as much in-person instruction as possible. Uh, while, of course, maintaining the safety and security of the school environment for all students and staff. This remains our goal, uh, whether it's this current year or it's next year. We want students to be in school as much as possible. But doing that isn't as simple as it sometimes might seem, so I'm going to discuss that. Um, first, I'll just get right to the punchline. The punchline is that our plan and our hope and what we're what we're planning for right now, as of today, March 22nd, is to transition all of our students in grades six through 12 back into school five days a week. In other words, we want to transition our grades six through 12 students into the same schedule as our K through five students have had since the beginning of the school year. And tentatively, we are targeting April 19th. That's one week after we return from spring break for our students in grades eight and 12 to return. We will wait a week then. The reason for that is that we need to work through some of the logistics of moving more students through the buildings into and out of the buildings, you know, upon arrival, dismissal. Uh, we want to make sure that we have processes in place that still maintain the kind of distancing that we need to have and that things are orderly. Uh, once we clear through grades 8 and 12, we'll go to grades 6 and 9. And then two days after that, we'll bring the rest of the students back, grades 7, 10, and 11. Um, we're going to prioritize the 8th and 12th graders because they only have a couple of months left in their respective schools and we want to give them that deference and then we'll move with the grade 6 and 9 students because they haven't been in their buildings yet as a full class. So that's the preliminary plan, uh, but I want to talk about some of what has to fall in place in order for us to make this uh, a reality because I'm not telling you that it's a certainty that we will be able to do this by April 19th. It's the plan and it's the expectation and the hope, uh, but we need a few other things to sort of go our way. Uh, so one thing that I know is on everyone's mind, it's gotten a lot of attention, a lot of headlines, are the, the changes that the CDC announced on Friday. Just want to make clear up front that the school district is not governed by the CDC. Uh, the school district, as it relates to COVID, uh, is governed by the New Jersey Department of Health and the New Jersey Department of Education and, of course, any type of executive order that is issued by the governor's office. So even though the CDC has changed its guidance, that's immaterial to us until our New Jersey Department of Health incorporates the new guidance and then releases it to us. So just as an example, as an aside, the CDC recommends against daily health screenings for the purpose of checking students and staff for COVID, right? That's not a CDC recommendation, but we do it every day and we've been doing it every day of this school year because the New Jersey Department of Education required us to do it back in the summer. 
So even though the CDC doesn't recommend it, we are still required to do it because the entity that governs uh, what we do with respect to having our school buildings open right now tells us that we need to do it and hasn't changed that, that guidance yet. Just want to make that clear because I know some folks might think that if the CDC speaks by the next morning, we can do whatever the CDC recommends, and that's not true. In terms of the CDC guidance, which we of course anticipate the New Jersey Department of Health will adopt and will distribute to us, I just want to make sure that everyone kind of gets beyond the headline of the new rule is three feet and looks closely at what the guidance actually is. So first and foremost, three feet of distance has become the new recommendation, provided that all students are masked. When students are not masked, such as when they might be singing on this stage or playing a wind instrument, or if they're eating lunch or snack, six feet of distance becomes the, remains the, the amount of physical space between students. So from last meeting, I mentioned we have some folks who are wondering, why can't we just feed the students in the classrooms at the K-5 level? Well, this is the reason why, because we don't have six feet of distance in between our students in classrooms. And as soon as students are unmasked, they need to be six feet apart. In addition to that, six feet is in place for all elementary students, K-5, which aligns with what we've been doing. Uh, three feet, rather, uh, is what's required for elementary students. But at the middle school and high school level, the distance three feet only is applicable if there is low, moderate, or substantial transmission of the virus in the community. If the transmission tips into a high level, then the distance becomes six feet again. And then most important, and I'll dwell on this in a couple of slides, the distance required for the purpose of contact tracing and identifying close contacts and then subsequent quarantines remains six feet. So even though the CDC is recommending right now that middle schoolers and high schoolers can come to school if they're all in masks in the classroom three feet apart, if a student tests positive, we have to contact trace and identify all students within six feet of that student, not three. And that's a significant implication. In terms of COVID in New Jersey, I'm sure most of you probably know that New Jersey has pretty much the highest uh, rate of COVID right now in the United States. Since our last meeting, every week has gotten worse in terms of cases, number of cases and prevalence in uh, the state. And I'm bringing this up because, again, part of the CDC guidance depends on the, the, the level of cases in a community. So our level of cases have gone in the wrong direction since the last meeting here on March 1st. We're hopeful that they'll go back around and they'll, and they'll, and they'll start moving in the proper or in the best direction. Um, but at least since our last meeting, things have not gone quite as, as we were hoping. And so when looking at the CDC definition of high versus the New Jersey Department of Health definition of high, one of the things that I think our Department of Health will have to reconcile is the classification system and what is meant by high or very high caseload or case frequency in New Jersey. I don't have the answers to that. I'm just mentioning it because the three foot rule as it applies to middle schools and high schools again, assumes that you don't have a high level of transmission as determined by the CDC. So getting back to this uh, timeline then, what needs to happen before we get to April 19th is that I will confer with the Departments of Health, will monitor what the trends have been in New Jersey and in our region, uh, and will I'll make sure, of course, that the Department of Health is comfortable with moving to the next step of having more students in school uh, every day. The reasons why we would wait until April 19th is that, as I just mentioned, most of our staff has just received their first vaccination. We don't have very many staff members who are uh, fully vaccinated at this point. Waiting till April 19th will give us a little more time to allow that to happen. We know that we have many families and many staff members who are also traveling during spring break. Uh, 
we are hopeful that the rules regarding travel and quarantine will change before spring break. If they don't, the week after spring break could be questionable in some of our schools. We may not be able to staff school buildings uh, sufficiently to have in-person school after spring break. We're intending to have in-person school, but that's going to be a decision that we make as we get closer if the travel rules don't change. We also have ordered and, and purchased um, more desk shields. They should arrive by April 1st. We'll install those over spring break so that we'll have sufficient desk shields on all desks in um, grades six through 12. And then finally, again, this is just a reiteration from last time. This hasn't changed. The CDC guidance from Friday doesn't change this. Uh, because we have to have six feet of distance between students during lunch, even if we're utilizing desk shields, and I've confirmed that with our local Department of Health on top of what the New Jersey Department of Health says, uh, lunch is, is too challenging for us to, to manage at the current time. I also have to mention that aside from the case rate in New Jersey, the case rate in the district has also increased um, month over month. So um, the middle school and high school, uh, just in the past week or two, we've had a, a series of cases. And the reason that this matters so much and the reason why this matters so much in relation to that bullet that I shared about contact tracing and identifying close contacts within six feet is that we continue to have huge numbers of students who attend school in person. Uh, not every district has this uh, situation. Uh, we are fortunate that our kids are coming to school. But because all of our, so many of our kids are coming to school, as you can see the number clips 90% in many grade levels, we have less space in the schools when students are here. Um, and just to kind of like illustrate this a tiny bit, if you take a grade level with 90%, I see grade seven has 90% of students who are attending school every day. And by the way, these numbers have increased since the last meeting. There are more, more families now are sending their students to school in person, we think because they're getting vaccinated as adults in the family, whether they're grandparents that live in a, in a, in a household or parents who live in a household who might be compromised in some way. As they get vaccinated, they're feeling more comfortable sending their students to school. So we have more students attending school in person now than we did a month ago. Uh, but like a 90% number in grade seven, you might think, well, 45% of kids come one day, 45% of kids come the next day. The number is actually higher than 45% of kids because we allow some cohorts of students, like students with IEPs, English language learners, and others to attend every day. So the number is a little bit higher. And then when you actually get into a building, what you see is you might go by one classroom and there are only five kids in the room. There are only five kids in the room, let's just say, because that particular class, let's say it's German uh, in grade seven, maybe it only started the year with 14 students. It was a small section. Maybe five of those students have opted to be on virtual instruction. So you have only five students who are attending school roughly each day. If one of those students turns up positive for COVID, you don't have to quarantine anybody in that classroom because they're six feet between every student. But in the very next classroom, you could have 16 students. You could have 16 students because it could be uh, a seventh grade English class that started with 24 students or 23. None of them have chosen virtual instruction just by the luck of the, the, the draw. And maybe there are a handful of students with IEPs. And so there are more students in that classroom. And if one of those students ends up testing positive for COVID, then you have to quarantine, let's say five or six kids. So the fact that we have to use the six feet of distance for the purpose of identifying close contacts, at least as of today, means that we have much more quarantining to do the more students are in school. Uh, so this second bullet here kind of just sums that up. Right now, if we have a student who we learn is positive and attended school for two days, we might end up with 10 students who have to be quarantined because they were within six feet of that child for 15 cum cumulative minutes over those two days. If we double the number of students who are coming to school every day, it means we're going to have double the number of students who have to quarantine. So if, we're, if we have 10, let's just say, and it, it differs with every case, it's different. But if we just use the number 10, if the number 10 moves to 20, because remember, a, 
a grade six or 12 student, a grade six through 12 student is in six different classrooms over the course of a, a school day. If there are 20 students that have to quarantine and you have seven positive cases over the course of a week, that's 140 kids who aren't gonna get to come to school for two weeks. So I just want everyone to understand that when we're talking about bringing all of the kids back every day, there's a, a balancing act that we have to keep in mind, which is the more kids in school every day, the more quarantining that happens when there's a positive case. And it's not difficult to see how, if the numbers don't at least stay the same, but at, hopefully they'll come down, if the numbers don't do that, you could end up with a situation where we have 200 plus kids in quarantine by the end of the first week of bringing everyone back. And those 200 students won't be permitted to come to school for 14 days. And if at least they're abiding by the rules, they won't be able to participate in after school activities either, non-school activities. So we've made this trade off all year long in grades K through five, in part because when a student is, comes to school in grades K through five, they stay in one classroom and they don't bounce to six different rooms throughout the course of a day. And the trade off has worked for us in grades K through five, in part because we've had uh, fewer cases of COVID K-5 than we've had in uh, 612. Uh, if you look at these numbers, you can see that playing out. Uh, but when we make the trade off into six through, six through 12, there's a risk that's attached to that. And there may be parents watching right now who've been very lucky. They've sent their kids to school all year long and perhaps their kid has not wound up needing to quarantine just out of pure luck. I can tell you we have other parents who have children who've been quarantined three times. And I'm not talking about the two week closure at the middle school or the two week closure at the high school. I'm talking about kid finds out there was another student sitting next to him on March 1st. That student then needs to quarantine until March 15th, comes back March 15th, March 18th, another kid tests positive, that kid's out again now until April 2nd. And since we're closing in on the end of the school year, I don't want to see a situation where we have 200 kids who end up missing essentially the entire month of May or the second half of May and all of June, and that's the end of the school year. So I'm just mentioning it to say the plan right now is to bring students back, to recognize the change in the CDC guidance that the, hopefully the New Jersey Department of Health will memorialize this coming week, uh, move to more in-person instruction, but doing that does carry a, a trade-off and we will discuss that trade-off with the department of health we'll make an informed decision based on uh, the set of circumstances we face once we get closer to april 19th aside from grades 6 through 12 coming back every day uh, the other thing that we are going to try to do is to incorporate um, more activities designed for students to socialize with one another uh, i have this slide pertains to K-5, uh, but we're gonna do this throughout the district. And the idea here is that we're going to aim, once we hit May, uh, and we really have more reliable weather, even though the weather's been glorious the last few days, uh, to get students outside. It might happen during the school day for some special activity. We might do some things after the school day. So dismissal comes and we have kind of like a voluntary field day uh, after, the, after, the, you know, after one o'clock. Um, but the idea would be to, to bring students outdoor. It would be voluntary if it were after the school day. We might ask students to brown bag it or we might work with the PTO to provide food for students if it's after the school day. And we'll have some type of coordination of activities where students can take their masks off, provided they're six feet apart, uh, and socialize with one another. Uh, and in terms of bus transportation, if we do anything after the school day, then we would have to run the buses as normal. So someone might have to make uh, arrangements for that. At 612, we'll be trying to do the same type of thing. Um, it's a little more complicated 612, of course, because we have so many students. We have 1,000 students roughly at the middle school and 1,300 at the high school. So having gatherings and planned activities can, can become overwhelming very quickly. Uh, but our goal will be to try to provide and weave into the school day and school week as many activities and opportunities for students to socialize with one another as possible. Um, 
and that's just a, a, a aside from the special activities will encourage teachers to bring their students outdoors as well in addition to that if if we move to the in-person instruction or whether we have to not move to the in-person instruction on the timeline we want either way um, we've partnered with atlantic health systems again uh, this time instead of vaccination we or they are willing to come uh, here to district once a week every friday to offer covid testing for any individual who might want it these would be folks who maybe are concerned that there's been an exposure it's not for sick individuals you know folks who are not feeling well they should see their own physician or take care of their health uh, in in that way but this would be free covid testing any insurance would be accepted for to cover the cost of testing um, and it would enable a staff member or a student to be tested uh, so that if there was any kind of concern on a weekly basis at least they had access to something local in addition to that recognizing that it would be a, a pretty significant change uh, in grades 6 through 12 uh, we're going to adjust the the policy and it's on the agenda tonight for families who opt for virtual learning the all virtual option would be a 60-day commitment so once we hit that final 60 days of the year april 19th roughly um, if a student chooses virtual instruction the student must remain on virtual instruction if a student is in person and decides they want to go virtual you know as of may 20th that's a different story that's fine uh, it's more th the concern for us is more that we need to know which students will be in person because at the middle school and high school we are going to probably have to shift classrooms and reschedule certain sections so that if we have a lot of students in one room because very few of uh, selected virtual instruction uh, we would move that group of students to a larger room and we would trade off a section with fewer students into a smaller classroom uh, and we would allow those virtual students to attend any kind of special events like i was just discussing um, if they're able to get there we wouldn't want to withhold them or exclude them from uh, those opportunities to socialize with other kids as i said we we should have the new desk shields in place um, during spring break a couple of other matters and this arises out of changes from the new jersey department of health uh, that they issued to us a few weeks back uh, so parents have asked from time to time i see site like on the cdc website or on the njdoh website how come the school district isn't doing that the reason the school district hasn't been doing that is because we talk with our local department of health and in some cases they tell us yes that's what you should adopt in other cases they tell us no you shouldn't so a couple of the changes that we are uh, instituting that are based on our local departments of health and their uh, their recommendation to us is number one a fully vaccinated individual no longer has to quarantine if they have known COVID exposure uh, so in other words if you have a teacher and there's a student who's positive in your class and you've been within six feet of that student for 15 minutes but you're fully vaccinated you would not need to quarantine in that circumstance uh, the second change is that an individual who travels beyond new york new jersey pennsylvania or delaware or connecticut uh, at this current time we've been maintaining a 10-day quarantine uh, we will reduce that to seven days if the individual provides proof of a negative test three to five days after return and again that's from the department of health and again those are rules from the new jersey department of health it's not something that we just came up with all right that's what's kind of happening um, in the spring uh, of course this has been a, an unusual year for our students we've been working the past few months to try to address some of what we're seeing uh, among our students and we're looking at this summer as a way to bridge some of what students have experienced this year uh, into bringing them into a better position for next year so first and foremost at our last board meeting we approved uh, a teletherapy program or at least we approved staff members to provide teletherapy for students we are reapproving that on this agenda because there was a small typo but i'll just provide a little more detail here um, we've we've enlisted some of our staff members who are licensed health professionals uh, to serve as teletherapists for students who might have some social and emotional needs right now and could use additional support we have asked our counseling staff to identify students that they've been working with and that are on their radar screen and we've identified about 70 students and we're in the process of obtaining 
consent from their parents and also consent from the students themselves to make sure that they want to engage in this type of activity. Uh, and our anticipation is we will expand beyond that group of 70 um, depending on how many of them want to take us up on this offer. Uh, I have this up here on the, under the you know, banner of the summer because our intention is for this to get up and running this week. We'll be starting these sessions. Uh, if it goes well, and we're hoping it will, uh, we'll continue to support students through the rest of the spring. And then we'll do this all throughout the summer as students need. So if students are having anxiety, if they're having difficulty reacclimating socially, if they're scared to come to school because they haven't been to school, uh, some of them, then we want to provide this layer of support for them uh, throughout the summer so that they can have the best shot at coming back next year in as, um, you know, in, in as full a manner as possible. In addition to that, um, we are extending our extended school year program into June. Usually that program runs the month of July, uh, but for students who qualify for it through their IEP, we will uh, push it into June. It'll be one week after the school year ends that we start it up, and it'll take place at Lafayette Avenue School this year because we will have some construction happening at Washington. Side by side that program, we have what we call Brain Camp. It's a literacy program. Typically, it's for students completing kindergarten and first grade uh, who maybe are not reading at uh, grade level or not reading as well as we're, we would like. We're going to expand that from grades K-1 all the way through grade K-3. We'll run that on its normal schedule, but we'll have twice as many students based on the expansion into the full K-3 uh, grade span. At grades four and five, we are in the process of identifying students in ELA and math who might need some additional support academically. Um, and Ms. Chase is working with our supervisors and principal uh, Russo to do that. That's a work in progress. We also are looking at providing additional um, what we're calling step up math programs. This might be a week of, of kind of fine tuning and, and ramping up as the school year begins in certain subject area in certain subject areas or certain levels that are critical like algebra one and geometry that have to do with high school graduation and so forth. Uh, so we're working on that. We are aiming to set up some transition support groups. Uh, we're calling them kind of like connect groups. And we will, again, identify students through the counseling staff who might need additional support, additional opportunities to come onto school campus over the summer uh, and be with other students and sort of get their feet wet and feet back on the ground. Still working on that. The dates and days are two to be determined. And then we're going to probably plan uh, more robust transitional activities for all students rising up into a new school. So grades four, six, and nine will be the targets. And that'll be things like more orientation opportunities, more tours, more time for students to explore the schools uh, that, they're, that they're heading to. Uh, and again, we'll have the, the ongoing counseling support as we, as we need. Moving then into next year, uh, First and foremost, we have no guidance at all from the New Jersey Department of Education or New Jersey Department of Health about what the rules will be for next year. You might recall that the New Jersey Department of Education released its, its uh, plan, the road back on June 27th of last year. So that has yet to be updated for 22, uh, sorry, 21-22, which means I can't stand here tonight or sit here tonight and tell you exactly what our schedules will look like, exactly what we will be required to do. I don't know that yet. Uh, I think all indications are pointing to the fact that we're going to have other mitigation measures in place because the only population in our country right now of people that is not being vaccinated is the school-aged population. So we know that the school-aged population is gonna be behind all of the adult population. And if that's the case, my guess is there will continue to be certain uh, measures in place such as masks, such as distancing of, of a certain amount, and so forth. So our 100% intention expectation is that we will have regular days of school next year, full days of school every day for every student, uh, but we're going to need time to try to devise some creative strategies, potentially creative schedules. It could be that we 
don't have lunch at school, for example, if if we're really pushed on the on the distancing of six feet. Um, but that's kind of what next year could look like. We don't have any answers, and it's premature for us to try to um, to try to figure out exactly what the next school year will look like. However, we do have to adopt a preliminary budget. So I'll give an overview of that budget now, and the budget anticipates that we'll be back in school as normal. Uh, first off, uh, just so everyone you know kind of understands this, uh, there have been three stimulus packages that affect schools. The first one was the CARES Act, which was back in the spring of last year, so right when we were in the midst of the, of the lockdowns and the, and the terribleness. Um, the CARES Act ended up providing our district in the summertime about $73,000. So just to put that in context, the desk shields that we ordered in the summer cost about 140000 So the CARES Act, the federal funding that we got, only amounted to about half the cost of the desk shields. And one of the reasons that we haven't received as much money as some other districts is that we don't have any Title I schools. We don't qualify under the Title I. Title I is the, is the, the federal program related to free and reduced lunch. Because none of our schools qualify under Title I, the state sort of allocates a, a smaller amount to non-Title I districts and distributes it as opposed to distributing according to uh, Title, I, Title I funding, which is how they distribute most of their money. The second batch of stimulus just happened. Uh, we just, I think on March 15th, were notified of the exact allocations and uh, what we have to do to obtain them. But that was from the stimulus that happened right at the end of 2020. And we look to receive about $471,000. That number is a little high because there will be some non-public monies taken out of that. Um, and then, of course, there just a week or two ago was the, the latest stimulus, um, which I think is called the American Rescue Plan. We don't know yet how much money we'll get from that. But all of that money is one-time funding. It's not recurring revenue. So it's not part of our operating budget that you'll be uh, adopting tonight uh, on a preliminary basis. So we're taking the federal funding and we're pushing that into one-time expenses. We're going to use that to pay for the summer programs I just discussed and also the teletherapy for students. And then we're going to be looking at using, and our Finance and Facilities Committee uh, has been and will discuss this, uh, items like ventilation, other PPE measures, anything related to our response to COVID and the COVID pandemic. That's the federal side. On the state aid side, and our budget, of course, is comprised really of two primary sources. One is state aid and one uh, uh, is local property taxes, which comprise over 90%. On the state aid side, right before this school year began, the state clawed back a little over $300,000 in funding. So that left a hole in the budget. The state this time around has restored that and then kicked in an additional $319,000 of funding. And all of that is related to the S2 CIFRA plan, the Sweeney bill from a few years ago, which is taking money from districts that the DOE identifies as overfunded and steers it towards districts that the DOE identifies as underfunded. We have been an underfunded district according to the state aid formula for a long time, ever since it was implemented in 2008. And it's just in the last few years that we now are, from our perspective, being made whole, even though it's coming at the expense of districts uh, that are losing funding. Uh, then we've got the local tax levy. The tax levy last year uh, was $66.6 .6 million. The district or the Board of Education is permitted to increase the tax levy by a maximum of 2% and the district has about $10,000 in banked cap from last year. So the max permissible tax levy increase is roughly 2.02%. Through our discussions with the Finance Committee and then administratively looking at what our needs are, uh, the budget that we are proposing tonight for, for the rest of the board um, to adopt preliminarily would have a tax levy increase of 1.88%. Uh, and so it would leave a little bit of money on the table, if you will. Uh, that money turns into banked cap for next year, and the board could draw on it next year or the year after, gets three years to take advantage of it uh, if it so chose. There are two priorities for this budget. 
One was to maintain all of our existing programs, not reduce programs right now for students, especially given the, the current environment, and then to respond to the pandemic in a way that we think is appropriate and can enhance the, the programming in the school district for, for kids. So this budget, even though it stands at 1.88%, which is a little lower than the max, uh, accomplishes both of those tasks in our opinion. So I'll talk about, I'm not gonna go through every uh, program that is just simply continuing, uh, but I will talk about three enhancements that I'll note here. The first is, and this probably doesn't surprise you, but from, from what we're seeing as a district, from what our teachers and our supervisors and principals ha have been looking at, um, for the most part, because we've been in school so much, especially at the K-5 level, our students are about where they usually are at this time of the year. Uh, we don't see some you know, huge drop off in student learning. Um, and at the K-5 level in particular, we've prioritized math and reading. So math and reading, we are about where we, the kids are about where they usually are. Uh, there are some caveats there, but we feel pretty good about uh, how students have, have progressed this year. One area that we do have some concerns about, and we were um, looking to sort of uh, address this a year ago before the pandemic hit, but we think it's been exacerbated this year because of the pandemic, is writing. Uh, at the K-5 level, we have students who are reading quite well, but not writing as well. Um, we have some hypotheses about that. Uh, so for example, writing, and we use the writing workshop model for teaching writing to students, requires a lot of conferring. Teachers meet with students closely uh, for periods of time. They sit right next to them. They try to revise work. Um, a lot of that has been compromised a little bit this year. It's harder to be close to students and confer with them on their writing. Uh, and of course, students are on screens all the time and writing is just not as uh, happening as probably as fluidly as we'd like. So the budget includes a partnership with Drew University in the National Writing Project, it will provide professional development to our staff in grades two through five, and we think it will be a benefit to our staff that will extend into our students and help solidify some of their, their writing skills. In addition to that, our special education department um, would like to see, alongside our basic skills department, uh, some more support for students in writing. So the, this, when I say support, I mean for students who are receiving either special education or BSI services, some type of set of interventions for uh, more supporting their writing. Um, in looking at that, what we, have, what we are proposing is to add a staff member, one staff member at each of the K-3 schools. Our goal would have, be to have that person be special education certified and uh, reading specialist certified. We would then revise our schedules so that we lock in the writing workshop block of time, which is not always or not usually scheduled alongside our reading block of time. We'd lock them in together. We would expand the ELA block then to incorporate reading and writing. That would help us uh, become a little bit more flexible in other parts of the day. And we'd extend foundations into grade one. Foundations is a reading program a phonics-based reading program that right now we only utilize in kindergarten and then in special education classrooms. We would push that into first grade so that all first graders get uh, uh, foundations. Uh, and then we would use those three teachers in any other ways that we think could benefit students. Uh, an additional tier of support in some way, depending on what their schedules look like and what, their, uh, what the need is. Uh, so if, a, if we had a group of students who really needed some more interventions in math or more support in math, we might use the balance of that person that way. If we thought that we could do some targeted reading with smaller groups of kids, we would use them in that way. But we think it will help um, support the foundation that we're trying to provide kids in K-3, and it will help respond uh, to some of what we've seen this year. And then thirdly, um, we're going to resurrect a position that was actually the first administrative position I ever held in this district, which I took in 2004, uh, which is a dean of students. Uh, we're going to modify it a little bit. When I held the position, it was primarily focusing on student discipline, and that was, that was it, um, with some other things. Uh, but we're going to aim this position at the social reintegration of students. Um, we want this person to captain and innovate and build peer mentoring programs 
uh, more supports for virtual learning because we think that that's probably not going to go away for all kids next year. Um, come up with disciplinary and behavioral supports. Do some handle some discipline with students, but hopefully in a way that is restorative and in a way that builds relationships. Uh, help coordinate some support for students academically if they're struggling. Help with student advisory, anti-bullying, character education, and the whole nine yards. Um, and we're targeting the high school in particular because we think our, I don't know, seventh through ninth graders have had a, had a tough time uh, during the pandemic. All of the students who are in the middle school right now obviously are going to make their way to the high school within a couple of years. And we think that uh, building this type of support for students, at least right now, uh, this position might not be there forever, um, but in the wake of the pandemic, we think that this is a way that we can respond to students. I'll remind everyone that one year ago, <laughs> we were actually getting ready to um, uh, share feedback from the community because we had surveyed the community about capital projects that the district was planning to undertake. They included the replacement of roofs at five of the six schools, building security vestibules and all the entrances at the schools, replacing the track at Cougar Field, and also upgrading a lot of our ventilation units, uh, which are old and at the end or beyond the end of their lifespans. Uh, the pandemic hit and we scrapped that and went, it went to the side. We still might consider it, the board might consider it down the road, um, but for now, we're going to try to accomplish as many as, of the most pressing needs as we can uh, by taking money out of capital reserve and also um, now spending the money that we had earmarked for some of those projects last year that we couldn't do last summer because it was impossible uh, to do this coming summer. Um, so. You can see here, we'll, we'll take out 1.9 million from capital reserve. We'll use 1.2 million of surplus funds from last year that went unspent because we couldn't perform the work in the summer. And then we will build $187,000 into this operating budget for the purpose of capital improvements. Those capital improvements will include uh, replacing the ventilation unit over here uh, at the CHS and Lafayette Music Wing roof replacements, partial roof replacements, not full roof replacements, partial roof replacements at four of the schools. Um, and then the bottom two there, uh, replacing the interactive displays and upgrading the district phone system are left over from last year. Uh, in terms of revenues, um, the again, with the 1.88% uh, tax levy increase, you can see how the revenues add up. I can let Peter speak about this in more depth if you'd like. Uh, in a minute when I finish up. Uh, in terms of major expenses, again, this, this is to keep all of the programs running and to incorporate the enhancements that I just spoke about. Uh, at the 1.88% uh, levy increase, the annual impact for a house for $100,000 of assessed value is about $22 in the borough and $26 in the township. And we just multiplied by eight uh, to show a somewhat typical house in either municipality. Um, the success of tax levy increases the past three years, you can see, are moving in a, a positive direction. And uh, comparatively, we still are spending less money per pupil. Even though we've lost some enrollment, um, we are still spending you know, less on average than most other districts. And in terms of the state, we're in the bottom quartile of districts that are K through 12 in configuration and have more than 3,500 students enrolled. So, to summarize, I know I've gone quickly here, um, but by April 12th through 16th, that's the week we return from spring break. That's when I'll be coordinating with the departments of health. That's when I'll be speaking with members of the Board of Education about trying to implement the plan to bring back all of our grades six through 12 students every day. Uh, April 26th is the next board meeting. And at that meeting, uh, the board will be required to adopt the budget officially. Uh, it will be based on what I just presented, any changes you make, and then the approval of the uh, County Department of Education. And then we'll continue to prepare for what we're doing in the summer and what we plan to do for next school year, awaiting guidance that will help uh, make our decisions and enable us to make decisions, I should say. So that's it for now. You can jump back up on stage and we can discuss and ask and answer questions.
Mike, can you? Out of the number of positive cases we have at our grade schools, can we, do we know the number of them are actually in school transmission? So far, we don't know of any in school transmission. The, at least the Department of Health has not been able to confirm any in school transmission. Which is, this, I mean, if, if this, I don't understand why the Department of Health can't understand that the in school transmission is limited and why they can't work with us to improve the rules or reduce the rules in terms of keeping these kids in school. They seem to be o extremely onerous versus the risk that's associated of in school, masked, right? I would say most people, oh, actually I don't know that, my assumption would be is that transmission tends to be on non-masked people. I don't know, I don't want to wear masks, but wouldn't we, shouldn't we be fighting for lower um, um, quarantine times and, and, and things like that with the fact that we are fully masked, 100%, I would guess 100% of the time in our schools with limited proof of in-school transition because of the fact we're wearing masks? I don't understand why they're not seeing that. I, mean, I get it when you're not, when you're at someone's house and nobody has a mask on. But when we're in school, we are fully masked. So we have dramatically reduced the risk factor in school. And the CDC and the Department of Health should reflect that. And they don't. They lump us into the exact same situation whereby people are not wearing masks and we get transmission. And so we have no benefit. And honestly, there's no benefit of wearing a mask if they're, if they're going to keep us to the same standards. So. We should be fighting back as the schools for reduced quarantine times based upon the, the risk mediation that we take on a daily basis or minute, minute by minute basis. Yeah, I, I, there are plenty of superintendents right now who are trying to communicate with either the, the governor or the commissioner about the three feet in particular. The, the three feet if it were three feet and it was a true three feet, meaning we didn't have to quarantine based off of six feet, that would be enormously helpful. Uh, putting aside the whole lunch issue and whether you know once everyone takes their masks off, they need to maintain six or three. Uh, I think some would say that the CDC reflects that. They've made this, this move to the, they have never stated that three feet was permissible. We've been able to do it K-5 because the Department of Education allowed us to do it with physical barriers on desks. Um, so, you know, I don't, I can't answer the length of quarantine question much, but I can say that a lot of superintendents feel that the track record and what we've learned this year about in-school transmission seems to be that it's relatively infrequent and the benefits of having kids in school all the time outweigh some of the more restrictive rules around spacing, because spacing is really what it all comes down to in terms of what schools can and can't do with having kids in. And I have to repeat, you know, I said this last meeting, but you know, I was reading an article today, New York City, all the school, high schools went back, but almost 80% of the kids have opted for full virtual instruction. There are nearby communities right next, you know, right near us where they've got 70% of their high schoolers are all virtual. So if we had that high a level of students going all virtual, we could bring students back every day without any problem. We could, it makes it easier to find ways to do lunch, but we have 90% of our kids or 85% or whatever the number is attending every day. It makes it much more complicated uh, when you have to provide space to them. The three feet is a step in the right direction though. Sal, did you have a comment? Yeah, just a, a real quick comment, Mike. I wanna thank you for in your presentation, the action, the actions you're taking uh, to stay on top of introducing more and more social opportunities for our children to get together, especially after this troubling year. Uh, Matt and I asked you last week to expand it outside of, you know, K through five, and you did just that, including transition time in the summer. So, I. I didn't want to let it go without mentioning it, that how responsive you've been, and I hope parents thank you for what you're doing. Thanks, so. um, Al. Mike, I have a, I'm not on finance or policy, so this is the first time I'm seeing some of this, um, some of it not. So first off, the fact that we have a, 
90% of our student body in seventh grade back in very high numbers, that I think is something to be celebrated. That is a huge success. I know we're seeing it as a bit of a, a challenge, but it's also, you know, has been a huge success because the administrators, because of the teachers, because of the families in part, you know, doing what they need to do. Um, but if this is going to be, if your more in-person plan is going to work, we have to continue that diligence and we have to ask the parents to, again, if the kids are sick, you're going to have to keep them home. And is it a drag that your kid's home for two weeks? Absolutely. With increased students in school, we are going to have increased quarantine. What would be heartbreaking is for 100 seniors to miss their last month of school because we tried to move too fast. Um, so I, I, I get your plan and I hear what Matt's saying, you know, we, full speed ahead. But if we're, if we're going to be held to the, our feet to the fire with these rules, with the two, again, remember, we have two Department of Health. We have three buildings in the borough and three buildings in the township. Each one has their own Department of Health that Mike has to coordinate with and, 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 and run everything by. So I agree with Sal. I understand Matt's pain point. But I don't want to get to the point where we have to quarantine 200 seniors a month before they're graduating or, or eighth graders that can't participate in, you know, any type of year in celebration. So 90% is huge. It's something to celebrate. My question is, if you move forward with your first plan to move the, ninth, uh, the 12th graders and the, I believe you said, the eighth graders back, how quickly can you reverse it if, if the numbers skyrocket and you're quarantining 200 people? Is that something you can undo quickly? Or if you get three phases in and something goes south? I want to know what the flexibility you have. I, th I think we can move quickly in the opposite direction if we have to. Um, the C I didn't mention this, but the CDC guidelines also state that adults have to stay six feet apart from other adults and kids. Right. So the three feet applies to students. It does not apply to adults. Between that rule and the fact that most of our teachers will be vaccinated or are in the, they're all in the process, many of them are in the process of getting vaccinated, will make it easier, I think, to adjust if we have to say, this isn't working, we're gonna go back to the schedule that we've had all year. Because if, if what would make it complicated would be if so many staff were close contacts and they needed to quarantine then the school would have to close completely for two weeks. Okay. But we should be able to avoid that because staff should maintain six feet. And if you're fully vaccinated, one of the changes is you don't have to quarantine if you're exposed. Okay. I just want to make sure we have flexibility there. Um, the other question or comment I had, the summer, the summer program and the telehealth, so that's going to continue on. Are some of the summer programs that you're doing, are they all in person? Some of the math um, support, it, they're all in person, none of it's virtual? Our aim is to do all the summer programming in person. Okay. Um, there may be an exception in there about, uh, particularly I'm thinking with extended school year students who have access to extended school year through the IEP, that would be, th there remains a virtual option there. Um, that hasn't changed because that was memorialized in an executive order at some point uh, last summer, I think. So the intention is for as much of it as possible to be in person. Okay, which we always said was the goal, get, get as many people back as possible. And that's my last question is, the programs that um, the Finance Committee is recommending and the administration is recommending, you, you talk about the K through three additional support, you talk about the high school, you know, what are we going to do for the, the middle schoolers and rising middle schoolers? There seems to be a gap there. And, and, and the dean of students, you have the high school virtual learning support. Can that position also trickle down to the middle school? The high schoolers need support, but a lot of them are very self-sufficient. A lot of our middle schoolers are struggling. It's the first time they're hitting middle school. They don't call it the awkward years for nothing. Middle school is tough. I, I see a gap there in, in our middle school support, both from a mental health perspective but also from a support perspective that's a that's a great point so um, I should have mentioned this but the the idea with the Dean of Students would be number one transition so eighth grade would be included in certain ways in terms of their connection or their their path into the high school uh, we think that if we have roughly 90% of students who are attending physically now and only 10% attending virtually that the number attending virtually should shrink next year no matter what like down to 3% let's just say 
and the idea would be for the dean of students position to work six through 12 with virtual learning issues and we haven't like ironed all of this out it's still in the preliminary phase but what we're seeing with a we're seeing a lot of students who are on virtual instruction who are absolutely thriving they have a home environment that is conducive to their to their learning virtual they have a lot of support they're self-directed they're doing fine we have some others and it's a, a small number who it's not happening they're not logging in they're not completing work they're not responsive uh, and it's a struggle to to get them to plug in uh, so the dean of students position we envision working with those, trying to do outreach to those types of students and get them back into the fold any way possible not six through twelve school, not just at the high school level six through twelve six through twelve okay the slide had said um, high school yep sorry no no that's okay and I just to that point that support we don't know what challenges we're going to face. We don't know what this pandemic is, go is going to do. And again, I'm, like we said last time, we kind of were able to get a good handle on K to five. We don't know what we don't know about the six through 12, where the, the anxiety, the stress, the, the school aversion. So some of these enhancement that, that you put in the personnel, I know some of them are at the K to three level. I just want to make sure there's some flexibility there that, that staff can shift or backfill if you had to leave somebody behind but then shift up to the middle school and high school. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, neither do you. I'm not asking you to, to figure out this, but I just want to make sure that the budget is providing for enough flexibility that if we see a real stress point, say for rising ninth graders, for whatever reason, I don't know. But I, we know the pandemic is gonna have far reaching consequences that we can't even grasp right yet. The, the budget that, that the finance committee is recommending is there enough flexibility in those staff members that we don't have to hire an additional three staff members if the problem persists at a, a higher level than what you're anticipating in next year's budget? Well, I, 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 don't, I, I can't answer that for sure, but what I will say, and the Finance Committee discussed this, is we, you've seen retirements hitting the agendas in the last few meetings. We sometimes use savings from retirements to help balance the budget. We did not do that this year. so. And, and this ties in also to one of the reasons for the, the change with f foundations uh, from grade K to grade one is that I th anticipate, and I could be wrong, this is just me, I don't have any like special data here, um, but we could see more students start first grade this year who haven't been with us in kindergarten, uh, like this coming year, they could be entering first grade not having been with us. Uh, either because there are families that have moved in from New York City and their kids haven't hit the district yet, they've kept them home this year maybe because they didn't wanna deal with everything that this whole environment entails. I think similarly, we could see, just like you're saying, issues pop up or needs arise that we are not anticipating yet or we don't know will exist yet. And by not drawing on any of the money related to retirement savings that should materialize once we replace the folks who are uh, announcing their retirements, um, we will have some cushion so that we can, or at least we'll have, some, we'll have something there that if we need to react, and it could just be as simple as we're gonna need another second grade teacher because we get an influx at one school with people who are moving here, uh, or it could be something where we're seeing a, you know, some type of trend in the middle school that is concerning to us and we need to you know plug that gap and make sure that the kids are getting what they need great thanks um we're going around the table uh, I, oh, sorry. go ahead bradley um you said i think 180 teachers have been vaccinated is there any eta for when if wanted all those teachers will have their first dose Thank you, Brett. So 100, about 160 were vaccinated because of Atlantic Health, or at least that's the number of names we sent them. And we think that all of them have either gotten appointments, just about all of them. Um, we've surveyed the staff, double that number have gotten vaccinated total. Uh, so we, have, we know that the majority of our staff is in the vaccination pipeline someplace right now. Um, we made the survey voluntary, so I, I couldn't give you like an absolute precise figure, but of the people who've responded, we know that the majority of staff right now are in the pipeline of vaccination. I just have a quick question about funding, um, the state funding. Is there any um, 
I don't know the better word, I'm too tired, but like a perk for districts that have remained open, that have had in-person burners in their buildings every day versus the district who has never opened. And, you know, we all know towns that they've not opened their doors, but you know, it's much more expensive to open the door than to close it. So our district's being given, I, you know, are we getting additional funds because for having been open, for providing, is there any formula that's running in our favor for offering in-person education and all of the things that had to come with that? Because it doesn't seem, and if, if it's not, then I think we need to ask some pointed questions at the state level as to, you know, you have, I don't want to name towns, but there's some very close to here, and there are similar-ish districts that have not opened all year, and we've spent a tremendous amount of money to provide an education safely for our students and our staff. And it has cost a lot of money. Yes, at the current time, there is no allocation based on days of in-person. It's been all Title I, Title I formula. Yes, we've, we've tried to articulate that. I believe there's a bill from Assemblyman Weber. Um, I think he's out of Morristown or Morris Township, I'm not sure, to, to explore that idea, but I don't know where that is right now. Dr. LaSusa, um, when you were speaking about the partnership with Drew University, uh, you mentioned that <clears throat> for the most part we believe uh, the students are, are doing okay with the exception of perhaps writing, thus the partnership with Drew. My question is, um, without the benefit of standardized testing, how do we know that? Well, right, so the in, the, in the special education community, there are different exams and tests you can take uh, regularly to identify regression gaps, right? Not so for you know, the general education population. So how do we know that we don't have people slipping, students slipping grade levels in, in reading without standardized tests? Well, the standardized tests wouldn't tell us that anyway because they wouldn't even be administered for another three weeks and then we wouldn't get the results until September uh, or August or something right. like that. So how did we so determine? So we're, we, we're using the same types of assessments that we've always used. So our teachers are running records on students' reading uh, levels. Uh, we have unit and other type tests and assessments in mathematics or in science or in you know whatever the, the subject might be. So the teachers are all gathering the same kind of data and inputs that they always do. So when I say that they're not reporting, you know, big differences for the most part, again, we've made decisions about curriculum. We're teaching social, social studies and science, for example, differently than we have in the past. Um, what I'm referring to is what the teachers are generating and gathering on a regular basis and comparing prior cohorts to this year's cohorts. They're not seeing a drop off. I've also looked at semester grades six through 12 um, and similarly, Again, acknowledging that teachers have had to make choices and acknowledging that some kids are taking assessments from home, so I can't you know, verify that that's all their work or they're not Googling answers or, or things like that. Um, the grades on a semester and marking period basis are also roughly the same. Okay, so we're talking about you, the primary measure is grades. Primary measure is teacher assessment and teacher assessment data, which is what it always is. Right, like, in, I mean, in other words, if we had NG, if we had administered NJSLA at the end of last year, we wouldn't be administering NJSLA until the end of this year. Right. So we make decisions all throughout the year, not based on NJSLA, but on the types of assessments that the teachers are giving in the classroom on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. questions or comments on any of the presentations I want to thank the Finance Committee for <coughs> working so hard over the last few weeks months on the budget um, 1.88 is I think something to celebrate it seems we're getting everything that we need um, of course it's not everything we want but it's everything we need and that's always been the game plan um, Matt uh, you're chipping through your list of capital improvements you know capital the capital projects I 
don't have any other questions. Um, does anybody else have any comments? Nope. Thanks, Mike. I know it was a lengthy presentation, a um, lot to cover. We'll yes. hear more at the next meeting on hopefully our numbers go in the right direction and we can move quickly in the direction that Matt wants us to where we get everybody back in school as quickly as possible without too much risk. Thank you. And I have three other items. Uh, the f first one is picking up right where Mr. Ryan was, was leading, um, which is New Jersey has applied for a waiver from standardized testing uh, with the federal government, the, the uh, U.S. Department of Education. The U.S. Department of Education initially kind of signaled that they may not grant waivers and we may be required to, um, inst to deliver standardized tests. So the DOE sent a memo to all of us last week telling us basically to prepare to administer standardized tests. They're still working out how that would be done. There would be a virtual option of some kind for kids who are not in school. Uh, I'm just putting it on the agenda to make everyone aware that that's an unsettled issue and it is possible at least that we'll have to administer some uh, revised format of NJSLA uh, this spring, somewhere between the beginning of April and the beginning of June. But that's all to be determined. I'm just letting you know that the DOE has put us on notice that we need to start preparing for that possibility. And students have the ability to opt out of the testing as I mean, let's just say yes, they always have. Yep. Like I have my kid home and have, my child has not come to school and I can opt out and say I don't want my child to participate in this testing. Yes. But, I, but not, yeah, that, that's always a parent always can withhold their child from testing. Well, I think if they're going to require something so absurd, then people need the option not to do it. Yes. And, and they're they're also preparing simultaneously. This gets to what Mr. Ryan was asking about, too, for districts to report on student progress at absent standardized tests and that they're essentially requiring report card report card grades as a as an indicator um, so we're still trying to work through the doe guidance on what we have to provide and they're in their defense they're doing everything they can to figure it out with the federal government but they just don't have their answers yet but our next meeting mike is not until april 26 right mm -hmm. will you have to make a decision prior to that i mean how much if, student, if we question, find out that we are we, we, we there there are there are like a thousand questions to this so we we don't we, it's we don't know we it, it will depend on how much um how how lengthy the sessions are it will depend on what they permit us to to give and how when we deliver standardized tests now it, at the high school we have to call delayed opening because we use so many small group instruction rooms that you can't staff the whole school and deliver the tests. So the, that, the biggest concern I have is that in order to administer the test, we'd have to close school, period. Like, end of story, we wouldn't be able to operate school if we're gonna deliver the tests. And we can't probably give, we certainly can't give all the tests on the same day. So, I, you know, I floated the idea of just telling all the students they can take it at home between one and three and let them go ahead, do, you know, do the best they can. Uh, because I don't want to surrender in-person school for a standardized test where we've got half the state taking it from home and another half in school and I don't even know what's going on. So okay. bottom line is we have no answers to anything. They're preparing us for the prospect of delivering the test and they're preparing us to upload student progress data based on essentially report card grades um, and other, potent, you know, other examples of student work. Uh, in the coming months. Okay. We will not be meeting again until April 26th, so just as a general guideline, try to re minimize the impact to in-person school. We are doing that, and of course, we also have to contend with the AP window, which is different this year, and it runs, you know, the second half of May and into June, which it never did before. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, third bullet for me is we have two snow days remaining, and uh, the weather's beautiful and it's supposed to stay beautiful until we hit April. So we have two snow days remaining. I'm recommending to you that we end the school, day, school year one day early and utilize one snow day that way. Uh, the reason I want to do that is it gets the high school graduation off of Friday night and onto Thursday night and that's better for some families. Um, and then the second snow day we could utilize by having no school on the friday before memorial day which families tend to like so those would be the two days of no school 
if you agree. Um, and the reason it's on the agenda tonight is that the high school and the high school PTO in trying to plan high school graduation slash project, project graduation, which usually takes a place on a boat around Manhattan, that's not possible this year. They're working to try to do something behind the school, um, like a catered event type of thing where kids can have a nice evening, not too late. It would be like from you know six to nine or seven to 10 or something like that. Um, but that would be post graduation and we'd try to slide graduation into the afternoon at let's say three or four o'clock um, so that we have like a late afternoon graduation and then some type of evening event for students. But the PTO and the high school administration need a little bit of uh, certainty with regard to what date high school graduation would be. And then the final agenda item for me <laughs> um, is Mike. Yeah, um, go I'm ahead. Sorry, Peter. on the current calendar, you forgot about the two um, canceling the late openings. Yeah, but well, we've just been doing that all year. We, we've we're operating on an abbreviated schedule, so we would rectify the calendar so that it doesn't show any early dismissals or delayed openings for the purpose of PD. Um, the final bullet is, if you remember last meeting and the meeting before, we talked a little bit about the 22-23 calendar. I have met with the Teachers Association to work through some of the concerns that they had. I have a draft calendar in your folder that has the first day of school for students beginning August 25th. August 25th is a little later than we discussed, but it still provides one full week of school for students before Labor Day. And then the final day of the year would be June 14th, which is, accomplishes the goal of trying to reduce the amount of time students are in school after Memorial Day. And it retains the February break, which parents had wanted, as well as the uh, two days in November that some parents express as an ideal time to visit colleges. So I'm, I'm providing it to you. There's no action or anything to be taken tonight, but you can look at it and see if it's if it looks good, we can modify it, but this version of the calendar and some of the administrative changes that I discussed with the Teachers Association was um, amenable to them and a step in the right direction. So we'll, in the interest of time, let's keep this for discussion for maybe the next, um, next meeting, this calendar, but it, it seems to accomplish everything. Um, and this is based on the calendar that all the parents most of the parents overwhelmingly voted for just shifting the school year a couple of days. Okay. So we are using the survey results from the previous calendar. Um, but just in the interest of time, just keep this, maybe pull this out of the folder and don't send this home with Peter and just mull it over. Keep an eye on that. We'll bring that up at April 26th if everybody's okay with that. You're done? I am finally done. Very good. <laughs> Thank Sorry. You. That was a record. Okay, so Peter, we're gonna send it over to you. Um, very quickly on the construction end, the, um, the contractor has started work on uh, both the varsity and JV baseball and softball fields, so that's in process. Weather permitting, all the work should be finished by the end of March, uh, which is making our athletic director, uh, Mo, very happy. And we continue working on all the uh, the pre-planning for all the projects that are in the 21-22 budget. Uh, unless there's any questions, that's all I have. I don't have any questions. Um, anybody else? Thanks, Peter. Uh, so moving over to the committee reports um, and for personnel. Um, yes, we met on March 8th and just talked about any changes in staffing and um, any upcoming retirements. And we are meeting again on April 12th. Is that correct? Thank you. I don't have it up. April 12th. April 12th. Okay, excellent. Uh, curriculum, Ms. Kenny? We have it. Um. We did, we met, we discussed the, some of the plans that I shared earlier about bringing the students back to school and some of the um, oh, yeah. support programs that we're trying to have up and running into the right, spring and covered, summer. You covered it in the presentation. Yep. 
ok very good finance and facilities mr gill fill in which was also the presentation yes we met like eighteen times almost all of it is been already been discussed in terms of the budget and the capital reserves a couple things outside of that discussed were funding of paddle as well as boys volleyball we continue to recommend funding of new sports as long as it sticks to the historical kind of step stone stepping stones that we ask of these programs so generally speaking when they get to a fourth year of existence and they've proven themselves we put them into a relatively fully funded fully funded to say a suggested fifteen thousand dollars a year support from the district we did discuss the work family program and the issues that they have gone through due to COVID this year and the support mechanisms that we can offer them for the balance of this year we did discuss two things in terms of the normalization which is full day kindergarten which we're going to go forward with in terms of we have budgeted up to sixty parents and actually sixty children for the 2021-22 school year and then subscription busing same thing moving back towards a normalized environment in terms of our budgeting for the 21-22 school year one thing I did want to bring up we did discuss the facility use for non-rec activities such as Mr. A parties and other people utilizing our facilities as you all know there's a lot of summer athletic camps that that use the Chatham facilities and we continue to support this as long as they sit inside the CDC guidelines and then Jill can I bring this thing up now or so there's also an agenda agenda item on the Chatham Township board meeting tonight where they are going to speak to my picture if they're going to pass it but allowing on Sundays the use of Chatham Township facilities prior to 12 o'clock so they have the they have a policy that's to date is similar to ours we have been asked to clarify ours to make sure that we are not looking to do the same so unless anyone has any kind of desire to follow the Chatham Township policy shift if not we'll just call it a call it a night on that topic I have no desire to change it I mean we talk about it every year in part some of the we restrict some of the usage on Sunday because of the churches in the neighborhood and the neighborhood the surrounding neighbors and it's amplified sound correct Mike we don't allow amplified sound no sound until 12 o'clock four times four or five times a year we allow it at Cougar for football other than that there is it's not allowed and there's no amplified sound until post 12 o'clock so even though the Cougar field falls within the township that their resolution does not apply to Cougar field the problem with the resolution says fields within Chatham Township so we need to have it there needs to be a clarification that the Board of Ed fields are not included technically in the Chatham Township fields so our policy I just have to communicate back to the rec committee that our policy remains the same which we are not going to adjust our Sunday policy sorry Chris we can't hear you can you pick up the mic sorry yeah nothing gets played before 12 o'clock at Haas or Cougar well under our policy I don't have any play before 12 you just can't use sound before noon we don't allow very much play before noon, except for a couple of football games. Very yeah. limited. Typically, it's limited use. Typically, the only use of Cougar prior to uh, 12 o'clock on a Sunday is for the PAL, the PAL football because of the number of games. If they don't start by either 10, 30, or 11, they can't play all the games as the days start to get shorter because of the age level. And that's about the only thing we allow, unless there was something special going, going on. So, Matt, do you... Can you reply back or? Yeah, I'm just gonna take care of it. I'll take okay. care. Of it. I, I, you had me. At, I'm gonna take care of it. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm sorry, Matt. Was there more for the finance and facilities? Well done. Any questions for Matt on any of that? Excellent. Uh, moving over to the liaison report. Uh, do any folks have any liaison <laughs> items? Not policy. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Sorry about that. Policy and planning. You're the only one that's actually been working. You and finance. <laughs> Uh, yeah, policy met on the 10th. Uh, we discussed the annual IEP process with the attorneys. 
and uh, it was determined that certain information can be offered to parents prior to the IEP meetings. We discussed the daily health screenings and potential disciplinary actions uh, for intentionally ignoring the health screening and or sending uh, students to school while they await the results of a COVID test. It's probably a good idea not to do that, folks. Uh, rules for return. We talked to Mike, talked to us about the conflicting information from the Department of Health. Um, you can, if you're fully vaccinated um, and you don't travel, you don't have to quarantine. But if you're fully vaccinated and you do travel, somehow you have to quarantine. So there's a little inconsistency there that we're still working through. Yeah, how does that make sense? It doesn't. Okay, right? just wondering. Uh, virtual learning time change from 30 days to 60 days, we discussed that. And the expansion of in-person instruction, uh, which was covered in finance. Mike Ryan, if there's an opportunity, we don't meet as a board until April 26th again. If the CDC and the Department of Health comes down and we need to make a policy change in order to accommodate more students back into school, can you maybe coordinate if, there, if there's a need to have a full board meeting prior to April 26th, if there's an opportunity to, like, this time we, we waited until yeah. the 22nd to adopt the seven-day reduction. If you see an opportunity, please reach out and let's get a board meeting on the schedule if there's an opportunity to move more kids in school sooner. I just don't want to wait till April 26th if, if it's opportunity a, presents itself. I'm it, not saying it's going to, but if it does, I'm sort of... Yeah, it's a, it's a daily monitoring process at this point. We're, it's a daily monitoring process at this point. We're going to have to watch it every day right. to make but sure if, we're if on top of it. Open and, and you see the need that we have an opportunity, can you just reach out and we'll get a board meeting sooner than the 26th if we need to? Absolutely. Especially for our teachers. Yes. They're going to be vaccinated. Sure. If teachers can come back to school sooner, then, and we need to make a policy change, let's make that happen as soon as possible. That's all I'm saying, if there's an opportunity. Uh, thank you. Um, moving over to liaison reports. Does anybody have a liaison report or question? I do. Um, in regards to Chatham Borough, Mike, have you had a chance to set up a meeting with the um, with the borough as a follow up to the pilot program in River Road project? I did reach out to Steve Williams, but I haven't heard back yet on a specific okay. date. I'll let you know as soon as I hear. Okay, perfect. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other liaison reports? No. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to pass the minutes of the March first public and executive session. Uh, Peter, can you remind me who has to abstain? All those in favor? Aye. Abstain? And, uh, opposed? Thank you. Okay, excellent. So sorry it's taken this long. We have our first opportunity for public commentary. Hearing of the citizens during public commentary section of the agenda is an opportunity for any members of the, of the public to be heard about issues which are or are not topics scheduled for the current meeting to help facilitate an orderly meeting and permit all to be heard. Speakers will be asked to limit their comments to a reasonable length of time. And just a reminder, this is an opportunity for public comments. And if we can answer a question quickly, we'll try to, but it will not be a, a, a lengthy back and forth. So Joe, Bill. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, we have an opportunity to end, so um, we're going to move forward with the action items since there was no public commentary. Again, these agenda items are posted on the Friday before all board meetings, so they're out there for the public to take a look at. So just in the interest of time, um, Ann, I'm going to send it over to you for personnel. Um, yes, I'd like to move agenda items A1 to 18 on the regular agenda and um, A1, 3, 7, 19, 20, and 21 on the addendum, please. Thank you, Ms. Weber. I'd like to first wish my best to the folks who are retiring, including uh, Ms. Fanning on the, on the addendum. 
Um, I also would like to mention that it's not every day that we welcome a new member of the central office administrative team into the district. Uh, but as you know, several months ago, Dr. Vindalia announced his retirement. And since that time, we've been working on securing a replacement who we believe will uh, help lead us uh, in our areas of special services, as well as school counseling and other areas that that position oversees. Um, I'm very happy to announce tonight that Dr. Emily Sortino will be recommended for that position and uh, with your approval will begin uh, within 60 days. Dr. Sortino began her career in North Bergen. Uh, she spent her first six years there, uh, first as a, a special education inclusion teacher in grades one through three, and then as the district transition coordinator. Uh, she then moved on to Demarest, where she worked as an assistant principal at Demarest Middle School before being promoted to the principal of Demarest Middle School. Uh, she then moved on to Livingston. In Livingston, she was principal of a K through five school uh, called Mount Pleasant uh, Elementary School and then was promoted into the position of director of secondary special education, which is where she has served for the past couple of years. Uh, throughout the process, uh, Dr. Sortino presented as an extremely knowledgeable uh, special educator and advocate for all children and as someone who I believe will contribute in meaningful and important ways to our administrative team and also our school district as a whole. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sortino to the district. Uh, certainly if she'd like to just say hello and, and introduce herself, great. she's more than welcome to. If not, uh, we'll go from there. That'd be great. Thanks, Dr. Sortino. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind saying a, you know, a couple of words. Sure. Um, so first of all, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. I am thrilled to work in the school district of the Chathams, and I look forward to meeting all of the students, the families, and the staff soon and beginning our work together. So thank you. Thank you. We look forward to you hearing all your experience. Thank you to the hiring committee um, that helped out. I know that was very time consuming. So welcome aboard, and we look forward to interacting with you and watching you work with the administration. And a lot of thank you for working on the committee. Uh, welcome aboard. Any other comments on the personnel items? And again, the telehealth health is just on here again um, from last. It was on here last agenda. It's on here again because there was a, a the, there was a typo in the year, so we're just reapproving it. There's no changes to it. Any additional questions on personnel? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? There you go. Welcome aboard, Dr. Sorrentino. You know, when there's not a pandemic, there's about 500 people in the audience, so we may have to do this again. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk about, you know, something else to get a crowd in and then uh, bring you back. But thank you and welcome aboard. Uh, moving over to curriculum, Ms. Kenny. Oh, God. I am. You know what? The NCAA tournament is on. A little bit of a hurry. Matt, finance and facilities. Yes, I'd like to move action items B1 to 13 on your regular agenda. Second. to thank Mike and Pete for I think this budget which is again we always walk into these and say this keep the district moving and how do we improve it on an annual basis with the interest of the taxpayers in mind on everything um, a lot of these the, the things we're doing here uh, within the capital um, uh, reserve are, are things that we were going to have to go out to the, the public with because these are must-do items these aren't things that you know we're just doing it because we have the money, these are absolute necessities. Um, so um, we're doing a great job in terms of utilizing our monies in, in, um, in appropriate ways in our opinion. I think that um, the fact that we've now got basically three years in a row at or below that 2% number is reflective of just the quality of the district and the quality of, of, the, of the handling of the monies um, within Chatham. So thank you guys. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? for Matt or anybody on finance? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
extensions? There you go, Peter. Duly noted the business section passes 8-0, and I'll circle back that the curriculum passed 8-0 as well. Why didn't you do curriculum yet, though? I'm sorry, the, uh, I'm as bad as you, the uh, personnel. Personnel, passes. excellent, thank you. Um, Lada, now on to curriculum, I apologize. Yes, I'd like to move action item C1 to C3 for vote. So is the calendar and the, okay. Does anybody have any questions or are good with the calendar for this year's amendments? Um, Mike, if the if there's a lightning storm on the new day, will we just shift it to Friday graduation? Yes, or we'll take back the we would take first back the Friday before Memorial Day. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant if there. I it'll thought you meant if the. It'll be too late. You can't take it back. I then. thought I thought you meant if the power went out and we needed to actually shut down schools and utilize one of the snow days. That's always my like thinking. Oh, got it. No, I'm thinking of um, graduation. Sorry. Yes, then we would use probably the Friday as a uh, rain date. Okay, okay. Just a, yeah, you can't take back the Friday before Memorial Day can, weekend. No take backs. Okay, and the HIV, I noticed the pandemic, if nothing else, our HIV numbers are going down. While we don't have the details, I do have the summary. No, no, I think the character education program is working. I think everybody's being kinder given the pandemic, so that was one plus out of the pandemic. Any additional comments on curriculum? Excellent. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extensions? Duly noted passes 8-0. Excellent. Uh, moving over to policy, Mike Ryan. I'd uh, like to move action items <coughs> D1 through, through D3 on the regular agenda for a vote. So the first set is adoption and the second set are first readings? Yes. Yeah. like to say um, if any of the board members have an extra like six hours that they <clears throat> you know want to waste some time read all of these policies Excellent. <laughs> thank you okay. all right since Mike and policy we're working so hard on all these I want let's have a little more enthusiastic all those in favor Aye. Aye. I'll take it <laughs> opposed abstentions excellent thank you great thank you um, any uh, board business? Matt, you brought up your item already. And are folks all good with um, talking about the 2022-23 calendar at the next meeting? Excellent. Okay, that would be the board business. Okay, so we have our second opportunity for public commentary. If anybody would got so motivated in the last five minutes. No, nope. seeing none. Excellent. Um, Dr. Lasusa, we do not have an executive session, correct? Excellent. Okay, very good. Well, this was um, a tremendous amount of content. Thank you. I appreciate it. Everybody drive safely. I uh, make a motion to close the public meeting. Second. All those in favor? Done. There you go.